All right, strain wave mounts versus the traditional worm gear driven types mounts. What are some of the differences? And we're gonna cover some of them and also like how that might affect your astronomy. Also maybe whether or not you wanna buy one or the other. Okay, the big one that everybody talks about is the weight, all right? And honestly though, the weight isn't that huge of a factor if you discount the tripod legs and the counterweight, okay? Other than that, like if you just take just the head and compare it to that, I mean, in the scheme of things, it's not that huge of a difference, okay? What makes the new AM5s, or the new strain wave mounts lighter, is the fact that almost all of them come with a carbon fiber tripod. An old traditional mount like this could easily come with a carbon fiber tripod and shed a lot of weight, all right? Now, the counterweight's still there, so, you know, that's obviously some weight. Now, why would you want all that extra weight? I don't know, if you exercise, if you wanna get big and buff like me, that's not how I got big buff, by the way, was carrying this thing out. But a lot of guys, like the bigger mounts, they will put them on wheels and even push them out rather than carrying them, because, you know, these, these old traditional mounts do get quite heavy. Now, when I reviewed the AM5 that I kind of had in frame here a second ago, I talked about how it was the most windproof mount that I've ever used. And that is actually by nature because of the strain wave feature of the gears. Now, this guy here is worm gear given, and because it's worm gear given, worm gear driven, yeah, the, there's always play in the gears. You can't have complete engagement on both sides of the teeth of the gear that basically moves this thing. And because of that, as you can see right here, there's always, always backlash, okay? In other words, when this telescope's going one way, and then it changes direction, has to go back the other way, it has to take up the slack in those gears. In addition to that, when this thing is out here in the wind, that backlash can be blown around, so to speak. In other words, the wind can basically move this thing a long ways before it's actually stopped by the gears. Now, a strain wave mount like this guy here doesn't have the problem of backlash because the gear is basically a big hollow ring that gets deformed by another internal ring as it uh, essentially like engages the teeth of the outside ring the teeth are engaged on both sides fully all the time. And that means that backlash is virtually non-existent and also that play is basically non-existent. Like when I, when I work on this thing, it doesn't move. It feels like one great big piece of solid metal. And that's because there's no backlash in it. And I said that these guys were basically windproof versus the old worm drear given mounts. And some people actually argued with me on this count in the, in the comments and everything. And, and I think they're, they're missing out on something here is that they were talking about the weight. They thought that the weight of the, of the mount, because it was a lighter mount, that would make it something that could be blown around more easily. And that's just not the case because weight has nothing to do with whether or not something is blown in the wind. It's, it's stiffness and it's rigidity that is what is going to determine. And, and by the way, I've had both of these rigs out here at night and I'll be sitting there watching the guiding and all of a sudden the guiding just be all going all crazy on the ioptron, but this guy stays solid. Okay, go outside, what is it? It's always the wind. The wind blows that ioptron around, whereas the AM5, because it's basically one gigantic, almost a rigid piece of metal, it doesn't, it's, it's windproof essentially, all right? So, yeah. Strain wave mounts, basically windproof, as windproof as they can get. If you're worried about the weight thing, well just get a heavier tripod base for it. Uh, you don't have to buy the carbon fiber tripod that comes with the AM5. You can buy an Ioptron base like I have over here, and they're much, much heavier, and these AM5s will connect to them, and that will get you the weight that you're maybe looking for. Another difference between these two types of mounts is going to be your exposure lengths, okay? Now, exposure lengths, which I did a tremendous amount of testing. This is my one-shot color duo, okay? And testing through narrowband filters and so forth. And a lot of people seem obsessed these days with using 
short exposure lanes for their guiding. You don't necessarily need short exposure lanes. Basically what you need to do is you need to find the exposure length that your mount works best with. Now, this Ioptron 45 Pro, it likes a four second exposure, okay? That's where it guides the best. Its RMS is the best at four seconds. If I go shorter than that, RMS will go up. If I go longer than that, well, RMS will go, RMS will go up. Now my AM5 here, it tends to like a one second and often two second exposure length times. And basically I found that by experimenting with different exposure lengths. And that's what you should do. And you know, this is the only thing you kind of got to be aware of between these two mounts is that with these strain wave mounts, you will be using shorter exposures. You won't be using quarter second exposures, okay? But <laughs> you know, who knows? Try your configuration out, try different exposure lengths with it. Let your telescope tell you what your exposure length should be. Uh, don't get on the forums and like let people tell you that, okay? Because it seems like a lot of people are getting themselves into trouble. They're, they're maybe trying, they're not able to guide, they can't get a, find a guide star or something like that. And then they, they blame it on the duo. That's not because of the duo, it's because they're using too short of exposure length time. And what they need to do is basically experiment with different exposure lengths and then find the one that works the best, all right? Have I harped on this enough? All right, let's move on. So this is the AM5. The AM5N is now here. And this is the last thing we're gonna say about periodic error. Periodic error in strain wave mounts, it is higher than the traditional worm gear driven mounts. Yes. However, worm gear mounts, they have not improved in 30, 40 years, okay? They've kind of stayed the same. You know, if you buy a top of the line mount from 30 years ago, it's gonna have kind of the period, same periodic error issues that today's modern mounts will have. Not so the case with strain wave mounts. If you buy, if you have a strain wave mount that was from 10 years, you know, five, six years ago, it's gonna have a lot more periodic error than the newer ones do. These things are getting better and they're getting better a lot faster than, you know, I actually thought would happen. <laughs> and I, okay, for example, the AM5 here, this was introduced about two years ago. In two years, ZWO was able to cut the periodic error in half. Okay, that's a big improvement. And what this means is that you can do longer exposures with the AM5N than you can with the older AM5. So if you're dealing with exposure length issues, well, with your guiding, you know, if you have an AM5N, you know, like I said earlier, try different exposure lengths, see what works with your mount. And what can we expect to see in the future? These aren't ever going to surpass traditional worm gear mounts because of the nature of the design, they're always going to have some more periodic error in them. If you put the same amount of effort into manufacturing and machining a worm gear driven mount, it's going to have the same amount of period. It's going to have less periodic error than an AM5 or a strain wave mount would. You know, all other factors being equal just because of the nature of the design. But these guys are going to improve and they're going to improve a lot more. And so the gap is going to get closer. And eventually it may get so close that it doesn't really even matter. So the last tip that I will give you is it's kind of an exclusive thing to the AM5. Now the AM5, it comes with these rubber feet attached. They're screwed in. Now, if you look at mine, I use the spikes. These, these are also included with your mount if you buy the tripod. Now, just about everybody, it seems, they just leave these rubber feet on. But these rubber feet are a, for a specific type of use. They're for visual astronomy. They are not for astrophotography. If you're doing any kind of astrophotography with your AM5, then you need to use the spiked feet. Now, these right here, this, this is actually a dampener foot that's for my Ioptron. And it used to be that I, I always put these underneath my feet, kind of religiously, because hey, it you know dampens the vibrations, right? 
Well, when I did some experimenting, and <laughs> I'll tell you a little fun story is my son, this was his job, was putting these under the feet of the tripod as I set it down. He loved doing that back in the day, but I don't do it anymore. And that's because I did some side-by-side -side testing. A lot of it had to do with AM5 here. And when I did my side-by-side -side testing with rubber dampeners versus non-rubber dampeners, I found that for astrophotography, it was better to have as solid a connection with the earth as possible, and that meant metal onto pavement, all right? And hence the reason I used the spiked feet. So if you are doing astrophotography, use the spiked feet. If you are doing visual astronomy, that is what these are for. Because when you're doing visual astronomy, you're always gonna be kind of touching and, and bumping into, or maybe your eye is like right up to the eyepiece and it's making the whole thing vibrate a little bit. Well, these rubber feet will kind of absorb those vibrations and kind of lessen them a little bit. Whereas if you're just doing astrophotography, basically what happens is <laughs> these rubber feet, when attached to the bottom, they basically make a cushiony surface for the whole thing to kind of teeter-totter on. And whenever there's the slightest breeze, it will push them around, depressing these rubber feet. Whereas the steel feet won't do that. So if you're looking for more wind protection, you know, if you want breezes to basically influence your, your guiding less, do not use rubber feet, use the steel feet.